So yeah. All right. So hi, hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Today is a pleasure to have you uh, for our Prelude Break Seminar, Brian Shirley from FAU Erlangen Nuremberg University in Germany. So Brian is going to be talking today about big equipment and tiny structures and motive analytical approach to unraveling the conodont conundrum. So before we actually go to uh, Brian's talk, we're going to have, uh, I mean, if, if you're familiar with Prelude Break's talks uh, and seminars, you, you have seen this, how it works before, but just a little bit of the format of the seminar. So we usually have this uh, five minutes welcome and announcement slides, and then we proceed to the talk. And after the talk, we're going to have a, a, a short um, moderated Q&A session of about 10 minutes, which is followed by a, a tea time, a tea time, which is a, a time where we chat with the speaker about research and other stuff. And just this is the first uh, reminder that you can send the uh, questions um, to Brian for about his talk via chat. So you can send this uh, to the, our questions host. And before we proceed, just a little bit of housekeeping. We would like to remind you that Palo Perks uh, values the participation of all people interested in Palo fields. And we do have a code of conduct that we like people to abide by, to everyone that uh, watches our seminars to abide by. So if you end up, ended up here uh, without doing this, please go to our, our web, website and abide by our code. Also, you should not be able to unmute yourself during the talk, but if you do, please remain muted. And again, you can send the, the questions to uh, our questions host that today is Natasha. Uh, via the chat, but you can also now uh, raise your hand. So there's a function to raise your hand on Zoom and you can do this and we can let you unmute yourself and ask your question directly to Brian. Uh, we now have um, Zoom captions. So if you do want them to show up, uh, just press the little CC button or to hide them. It's the same thing. You just press the same button. Um, and if you know someone like a nerdy career researcher that you'd like to nominate uh, to give a seminar um, uh, in Prelude Perks, please go to our website. You should be seeing the uh, the the, web, uh, the form for nominating uh, early career researchers on the in the chat right now. And also another thing in the chat that is going to be uh, you're going to be seeing uh, in a few seconds is our weekly feedback form for demographic information. It's anonymous, optional, and but it's very much encouraged by us uh, because it's, it can be very important. So finally, um, I'd like to, oops, oh, yes, I'm <laughs> sorry. So finally, I would like to introduce Brian that's been going to be talking to, uh, to us today. So Brian did an undergrad at NUI Galway in Ireland, uh, followed by a, a master's at the University of Lille in France and is now a PhD student at FAU Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany. So welcome, Brian, uh, and you can take the screen share now and give us the talk. Thank you. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, share screen. Dun, 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 dun. Um, so you, can you see that? Yes, yes. And you can hear me and everything's okay. Perfect, yeah, awesome. Okay. Uh, great. Wait. Ah, uh, yeah, it's okay. Um, cool. No, awesome. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking today about uh, the big equipment and tiny structures. I'm going to be talking more or less what I've been doing for the past few years on my PhD. Show you guys um, a little bit of stuff that I've already been working on, stuff that I'm currently working on now, and basically where where I'm going from here. Um. So because I have half an hour, which is excellent and something that I really like to do is kind of like introduce people to what conodonts are. And um, I think this kind of like just sets, it, it kind of helps me justify why I am doing what I'm doing. So uh, conodonts are an extreme, uh, extinct group of vertebrates that range from like late Cam Cambrian to late Triassic. And um, so they lasted for like a really, really long time. And uh, they're known mainly from their hard tissue remains. These guys are the oldest biomineralized dental tools. So essentially what we're going to be looking at today is a series of microscopic teeth that can be found in limestone um, from all across the world. You can go and you can um, 
basically from a half kilo, you can dissolve it down and get thousands and thousands of these samples. Um, and also these guys are extensively used for biostratigraphy and geochemistry. And this is like what they've been used for for the past couple of decades. But what I really want to focus on is this part of it, because even though they're used and utilized so much in science for so many things, and uh, the ecology of these guys, these are not really understood. I mean, we have a lot of information, but it's not fully tied down. And I'll explain in a little bit kind of what I mean by that. Um, and it's not like this hasn't been known for quite a while. It's not like people don't know that uh, this is a book called The Great Fossil Enigma, which is the search for the common animal. So people have seen these for almost 100 years. People have been identifying these, these but it's only relatively recently that we actually knew what kind of animal created them. And um, for people who haven't come across conodonts before, I'm going to give you a little view of what we're going to be looking at. And that is these sort of 3D structures here. So these are, are microscopic teeth. You can see they come in a range of forms. And um, you can see down towards the bottom, we can have these little guys that are like coniforms, which are essentially the most primitive ones. But they can range from uh, bar shaped with lots and lots of little denticles on them, or else they can be really, really robust. And this is what kind of makes them really, really um, utilized for biostratigraphy because there is a lot of morphotypes. There's a lot of different shapes and forms of these guys spanning for a very, very long time in the geological record. And when I mean a lot of morphotypes, there's like a whole lot. These are two kind of examples of like outlining different morphotypes of conodonts. One is by, I hope I don't butcher this, Igo and Kyoki. Um, from the Carboniferous in Japan. And then these are drawings from uh, Muller in 1960, which kind of outlines different morphological forms through time, just to outline what we're dealing with. And another question that I think is relatively important is how small is small? It's going to become apparent later on in my talk that um, from the techniques that I use, I'm trying to outline the difficulties that we've had. And to put that into perspective, uh, this is an example of a, a human hair, which is uh, most of the time somewhere between 80 and uh, between 80 and 100 microns across, depending on where it comes from. And this is the size of, so this is a proconodontus, which is like a really, really early conodont. And it's very, very small. So you can imagine that these guys are really, really hard to deal with. Um, then we've got different forms that are slightly bigger and sometimes they even get a lot bigger than this, but it's just to put into perspective and um, yeah, to, to put this all into perspective, what size we're dealing with. So one of the things that we kind of already knew before I started working on Conodonts or really knowing what Conodonts were, were uh, how do we know what Conodonts look like? Like what do we know from the actual animal itself? And you can see even back all the way to the 1970s, uh, this is from Lindstrom kind of trying to depict what um, a conodont may have looked like. At that point, he was kind of uh, deciding that maybe they were like scales on a fish or something like that. This is very lovingly now referred to as like the toilet roll. But we know a lot more now. And if you look at artist renditions or people drawing conodonts, um, you actually can see that a lot of people, we, we can't fully agree what exactly these things look like compared to other organisms that people study. And that is potentially down to the lack of soft bodied remains. These soft bodied remains are like really, really rare. We only found from a couple of localities across the world, only a couple of species, but it kind of allowed us to have our first insights into what the animal making these things actually look like. And this is from the Granton ship shrimp bed in Scotland. And this is one of the best preserved that has ever kind of been found. And this is where we started to look at, oh, these, it wasn't the shape of a toilet roll. They weren't really scales. This was actually like a little eel-like creature. And uh, it had eyes, it had potentially a notochord, it presented, it, um, preserve some muscle structure, we could see um, the fin of it. So this is probably an active like swimmer or at least able to do sort of like short bursts. When it comes to the actual teeth themselves though, um, 
trying to work out how they functioned was a, a different challenge that kind of had to be addressed. And a lot of these are now done from natural bedding assemblages. So these, uh, what would you call it? Hmm. Sorry. These come from um, either diagenetically fused teeth that have been stuck together, um, or else they come from bedding planes within the rock. And this is an example from Purnell and Dunhue in 1997. And you can see that they had found this little array of all these different morphotypes stuck together. And this is a drawing of it. And then they actually built a physical 3D model, which is really, really cool. And this is giving us insights into what they look like. So we know some of the soft body, we know what these guys, um, the teeth themselves were doing. Um, so this is a, another 3D model and kind of to just put that idea of uh, what the soft bodies were and the actual teeth themselves. This is uh, my cartoon rendition of a commandant head. And you can see they're split into two distinct groups. This is kind of known as the S array. These are called M elements. This is not super important, but it, it's good to cover. Uh, these are the P2s and the P1s. So essentially what it is believed is that these teeth up here were used for actually grasping something. They would bring it back to the P2s, which would grind it and then over to the P1s, oh, sorry, the P2s would maybe slice and then the P1s would probably grind. So this is how they did their mechanical digestion. But this also becomes a little bit of a problem. This is a schematic of uh, how these guys would have looked, but they actually have um, a lot more complex than you would first think. So this is um, sort of a generic setup or mostly what um, an awful lot of continents would have looked like from a top-down view. And you can see that even within these, the layout is more or less the same, but it, they change a little bit in their positions. But also you can get them where, okay, this is a little bit contested, but uh, you can have them instead of having like 15 elements, they might only have six or they might have more in a different layout, or you can get really, really complex forms. And um, yeah. So this is kind of like a super brief summary of what we knew kind of before I started doing these things. And what we knew is that we knew certain elements of the soft body. We knew it had eyes, a notochord, possibly gills, a tail fin. We kind of could understand um, what the body plan of this thing was. We also kind of knew that there's different types of elements and how they fit into this conodont apparatus. And that they were used with teeth, I, as teeth. I didn't have enough time to fully go into how we know this. There was different analytical methods used, like um, a lot of studies on microware, a lot of studies on finite element analysis, but this is the general consensus of what these guys did. But what we didn't really know is the ecology. Uh, what did they do? What did they eat? How did they grow? And for how long did they live? And that's kind of where my story began when I actually started looking into these guys. Um, so to talk about where my story begins, what you need to kind of understand is how conodon elements grow. And they grow by lateral accretion of um, what we call lamellar outwards. So essentially, imagine your own teeth, but they're growing throughout your lifetime. This is how these guys grew. So if we go and we take a conodon element, we decide we're going to chop it in half. We're going to have a look at these growths. Um, this is essentially what you're going to see. You're going to see individual growth layers protruding out. So in the middle is the youngest conodont per se, and then on the outside is the oldest. We can break this down into two different tissues. We've got the crown tissues and we've got the basal tissues. The basal tissues are not generally preserved, so we're going to kind of ignore them. And then we can further break down the crown tissue into the lamellar tissue, which is this gray and the white matter. But for most of this talk, I'm just going to focus on these lamellar tissues. And so, now that we know how they look and now we kind of understand how they grow, what I had started doing for my master's is I started looking into how can we use an SEM to quantify these growth layers and to have a look actually inside kind of themselves and see what, what can we understand from that. So I think most people will have an idea of what a scanning electron microscope is, but just as a really brief um, overview, you can look at... Um, uh, micro fossils in really, really high resolution. If you want to look at the topography, if you're actually going to chop them in half, you can look at things like crystallography, the chemical composition, 
and you can kind of calculate some chemical and physical um, properties of these materials. It's a really versatile technique because an awful lot of universities, well, yeah, an awful lot of universities have access to this equipment. And um, so it's something that is progressively getting more and more used. And this is what we decided I was going to utilize. Um, this is just an animation I love. If anybody wants to actually understand how an SEM works, I recommend this website. It is excellent tutorials. But essentially what you have is you have an electron beam that is scanning across the surface, taking individual dots and getting a reading back into multiple detectors. And it is the readings that we get back into these detectors that we can actually determine uh, what is going on, either with topography, chemistry, crystallography. Uh, so what happens in the, the subsurface? So when we actually hit a sample, we've got different depths of penetration. You're in an ideal world, this is kind of what it would look like. This is going to be your electron beam, and this is going to be where the electrons actually interact in the subsurface. In real world, it's actually a lot messier than that. But depending on where you different depths into the subsurface are going to give you different signals back that are going to tell you different stories. So if we go and we start at the most shallow, this is your topography. This is uh, an image. If you look at the date, this was right at the start of my master's. Um, and these are signals that come back really, really close to the surface. They give back mainly information on surface topography and probably the most simplistic. If somebody has the base knowledge of how an SEM and use an SEM, this is probably what they were doing. A little cartoon diagram of different techniques with um, an SEM. Uh, this is where the detector is going to be. And this is where my master started out because um, my supervisor had noticed that an awful lot of conodons in her collection had these weird sort of overgrowths on the side of them. They had like um, a lot of different forms. And the idea behind my master's was to understand what actually caused these things. And that's where the love story began, or, you know, that's what I'm going to call it anyway. And um, so you can see here, there's probably the most drastic overgrowths that we'd seen. There's a little one here and there's this tiny one here. And what we wanted to do was look at this pathological growth in these prehistoric teeth. And we wanted to use secondary electrons. So what I had been discussing before. Um, but we ran into an issue, and that issue is when I actually went and cut these guys open, what the majority of people doing this before had um, etched the surface. So because with this technique, you can only look at the topography itself, um, we had to etch it. And with the etching, you can kind of see maybe in this area. So this would be the white matter, and this would be the lamellar tissue. And we could see these growth layers, but they weren't really in a high enough resolution for us to um, basically answer why was this happening um so after talking to one of the material scientists here in the, the university and um, he pointed out that maybe we should use backscatter electrons because backscatter electrons would allow us to polish the sample perfectly or as flat as we could and instead of giving us information back on topography they'd actually give us information back on Mm, I wouldn't say the atomic structure, but the chemical composition. So if you have a different chemical composition, um, the way that the electrons interact is safe. For example, if you're looking at something that's more dense, more of it's going to be absorbed and less of it is going to come back to these detectors that I kind of discussed. And he was 100% right, as you can see with this. Um, and actually this is probably going to be a better figure. Uh, this being the backscatter detector, we were getting stuff at a much, much higher resolution than we had dreamed that we could. And so our samples went from looking like something like this, using this detector, to something like this, which is um, a, a lot better. And so we kind of looked at that. We had gotten better thin sections. Unfortunately, uh, no, unfortunately, I'll explain why I mean unfortunately in a couple minutes. Um, so then it came to how do we push this further and how do conodonts do what they do? Um, possibly a simpler way of doing that is how can we use uh, this information from isolated teeth to answer questions about ecology? And 
first had to look at what material do we have to work with? Lots and lots of tiny teeth and soft bodied remains. The issue is because I had spent most of my masters chopping and breaking sample to play with soft bodies, um, unless you know somebody who has one who's willing to let me do some stuff with it, I would be more than happy. So what options do we have? We've got 2D sections and we've got 3D models. Um, I don't have enough time to go and fully into 3D models today um, because that would be a whole other digression. And so I'm going to focus on the 2D thin sections, which is what I've done most of my work in. And then what can we use and what can we answer with this data? So with 2D sections, we can look at growth dynamics, chemistry, crystal growth and orientation. We can actually look at more than that, but this is what I'm going to focus on. Uh, mostly the growth dynamics. Um, what questions do we want to answer? And then just to combine it, we can use these different analytical uh, techniques to answer different questions. So starting out the 2D sections, it, I had already kind of shown that what we were doing was a lot nicer. We were getting stuff in really high resolution, uh, but it kind of ran into a bit of a problem. And that problem is, uh, regardless of what we did, or maybe not regardless of what we did, but at the start, we didn't have a workflow for preparing these things. So we wanted them as flat as possible, but ran into so many issues, had like a, and still makes me sad to the day, the number of things that actually broke got destroyed. Um, I'm pretty sure Amelia is in here and grimaces every time she sees this photo. Um, so it was just hours upon hours, I'd say hours, months in the lab, trying to work out a workflow. And then over time, just trial and error got better and better at this and kind of had designed a workflow into a PDF format that we were using with students and stuff. And we decided, why not write a paper? And this is <laughs> one of my better titles, uh, the kind of do's and kind of don'ts of phosphatic microfossil preparation and microanalysis, which uh, the journal Micron actually decided to accept, which made me really, really happy. And in summary, what this paper essentially is, is a workflow. So it's a workflow that has been applied um, to multiple kind of side projects of mine with uh, dinosaur teeth, um, different types of ap appetites, carbonates, uh, belemnites, uh, brachiopods, crustaceans, you name it, this seems to work. Okay, this paper is focused on conodonts, but this kind of like workflow seems to apply really, really good for different biominerals. And we started getting better and better and more consistent results. And so when we were getting these like better results, we were getting more things that we could look at that's when we could actually start looking at the growth dynamics of these guys. We could start looking and starting to answer questions about how they grew. And this is a paper um, that we have from, uh, it's in Proceedings B, I think it was in 2018. And this was looking at where we had chopped a comment on through its center point growth layers in different directions. And we could see that there seemed to be three distinct stages of growth. There seemed to be what we'd call stage one, stage two, and stage three. And when looking at this, we only had not seen kind of like the highest, res a really high resolution where we could count these individual growth layers. And um, we had also noticed that there was this thing called a tip spike. And so this is what we had defined as the end of stage two. And it's been known for a while with like microware and stuff that as these things come into contact, especially if they make mistakes, you can actually break a little bit of these guys off. And as they break off, you because they grow from the inside out and they continuously grow through their life, they can actually repair themselves. And so this had led to this where we could actually quantify where these things had broke, just to put it in perspective. This is around here. So this is where uh, the, the pointy bit would have been where it came in contact with the food it was eat eating. And we could see where there was a breakage surface and then there turned out to be this cyclicity. So there seemed to be um, periods in which they had mechanically digested, but also had worn away. 
and then regrown, worn away, regrown. But we actually didn't spot any of these up until, you know, about halfway through what would have been the commandant's life. Now, we don't know what these individual growth layers actually mean, or we don't know what they mean in terms of time, but we're just going on the assumption that they were deposited at uh, the time it took to deposit one was probably the same each. It's a bit of an assumption, but you can see that this tip spike didn't occur until about 55 layers in. So if they were mechanically digesting or eating stuff, and but they weren't doing it for the first half of their life, essentially what they were doing, what were they doing? Um, this is just a, a really nice photo that I've also made that kind of just highlights that these red lines are where there has been breakages in the elements themselves and it's still been able to repair. So it seems to be regardless of how much they break, they can uh, repair themselves into some sort of uh, fine functional um, tooth. So we went and we had a look and we decided that we we're going to go have a look at the chemistry of these guys because, you know, this is where I want to kind of highlight if we're using these things for geochemistry and we're ignoring the ecology and um, a lot of how organisms interact with their environment is going to affect how they grow and what elements they actually incorporate into their tissues. And this, it was our hypothesis that if there was two different, um, I oh, can't find the words. If there was these two different growth stages and we see one stage that they were definitely like actually chewing something and the other stage they weren't, then potentially they were eating two different things. And um, so we decided that if we have a look at the actual chemistry, then we might be able to do that. So as I was talking about these electrons, we're going deeper. We start looking at characteristic X-rays. There's this um, technique called EDX. And this will actually give you a percentage of what you're looking at in terms of um, different uh, materials that are making uh, different elements that have been incorporated in. And so we took the same comment on itself and we did these line scans, which you can see across the surface that within these younger layers, there is a massive dip. Okay, this is stage two, but especially within stage one, there's a massive dip in strontium. And strontium actually is linked to multiple things. It could be seawater temperature, it could be um, freshwater input, but it also uh, is how high or low an organism is on a trophic chain. And so therefore, implying that there is two different incorporate strontium is incorporated in two different ways in two different things it implies that this thing had two different lifestyles at one point it was eating something completely different to when as a juvenile it was eating something completely different to what it was as an adult um so with this um after playing a lot with edx we also wanted to have a look at um, how can we push the limits of this? So we can use uh, different types of simulations to actually see how these electrons interact with the subsurface of a sample. And this is Casino, which uh, shows us how, how large the area we're looking at is. And this is called NISTAT DISTAT 2. And we can actually start simulating the spectra before anything even goes into the SEM. And what we kind of find with that is that uh, the lower acceleration voltage and stuff that you were using or the lower energy you were using essentially would actually impact had the resolution of what you can see so here is with a uh, 5 kv and this one's with 15 kv and you can see that with the line scan you can actually see not only was the strontium changing between different ontogenetic stages the strontium was changing relative to how many growth bands there is. So not only is it changing because it's eating different things, it's also changing by how fast or how slow it's growing. And um, so this is a paper that will hopefully eventually be uh, published one day where I'd gone, I had taken um, how not only was it not only was it more important, uh, if you can remember back to when I was looking at these uh, top topographic sections or these etch sections, these also impact the quality of the data that you're getting back. Uh, boom, boom, boom. And so is like the tilt. So not only am I kind of trying to work out 
how these things lived, but I'm also trying to work out are the techniques that we're using actually valid. Um, but anyway, that is kind of a little bit of a summary of uh, what I had been doing. And I'm like, OK, cool. This is another question that we kind of have to think about is. This is for one genus of Canada, essentially, was what I was looking at. And that becomes slightly problematic because that cannot be used because there's so many morphotypes and there's lots of different forms. Then it's only logical to think that they probably lived in different ways. And so this is uh, from, uh, oh, yeah, let's compare different kind of morphotypes. This is from a paper that we currently have in review. This is actually work of uh, our master's student, uh, Isabella Leonhard. Um, and this was a comparison of much earlier conodonts, but also they were these single like cone sort of shapes. They're generally smaller and they're thought, um, would, actually, there wasn't a whole lot known about these really. And what she had seen from this was that actually compared to the about 120 layers that we had had, she was seeing like lots and lots of like um, a lot less layers. And actually, if you compare it within these two different things that have very, very similar forms, one of them seems to have twice as many layers as the other. She also looked at strontium and saw that, you know, the sun, there wasn't that much of a change. So what you're seeing is that these things maybe don't live as long and also don't seem to have a change in diet similar to what we had seen in the more complex guys. Um, this is cool story, but why do we care? And this is getting to kind of like my final sort of um, conclusions, I suppose. And what I kind of gone through with you guys today is that uh, you can look at the growth dynamics in chemistry um, and you can use these to work out function and ecology. So to summarize this, and I think I'm okay in time, is uh, we've answered some questions surrounding comment on ecology. Uh, conodonts, at least complex ones, or the forms that I was originally looking at, seem to have a multi-stage ontogeny with distinct chemical signatures, which imply that they changed feeding strategies through time or as they got older. However, this doesn't actually seem to be the case with all forms. So if you look at the work that Isabella did with these different forms, these are potentially two different feeding strategies. Um, there's difference in the number of growth layers. So potentially these two guys live for like different periods of time or uh, yeah, one was a fast living and the other one was slow living. Um, complex forms seem to show determinate growth. This is something I meant to cover and I didn't check the notes. Um, the, the bigger, more complex guys that I was looking at, they, um, you, you could actually see from the graph that their growth started to slow. So as they had gotten older, their uh, growth bands started to get closer and closer together, implying that there was a limit on the size that these uh, could have been. While if you looked at the simpler forms, they seem to more or less grow continuously. And kind of the crux of this is that future ge geochemical and paleoclimactic reconstructions, they might need for uh, when using conodonts as proxies, because if you have different um elements different chemicals that are being incorporated into a biomineral because not necessarily where this thing is living but by how fast it's growing or by what it's eating then you need to kind of start to take that into account rather than um just taking a whole load of like random elements chucking them into a mass spectrometer and just trusting the data that you get out from it um, and kind of at the end, there's a couple of people I want to thank. Uh, Amelia is my supervisor for my PhD and my master's. Isabella and Madeleine are two master's students that we had before. Both are gone on to do PhDs now. Michael Bessman um, helped us an awful lot with the SEM work and kind of learning the techniques. Uh, Christian runs our SEM here. Birgit helped with preparation and the DFG actually funded this project. And that is it. And any questions? <laughs> Fantastic. Great, great talk, Ryan. Thank you very much. Really, Thank really you. enjoyed it. <laughs> so uh, so before we go, I just want uh, to 
remind people that they can send questions to Brian via chat or by raising their hands and uh, using the reactions on Zoom and we can unmute you and you can directly ask the questions to Brian. So I'm going to start with some questions that we already got and I'll be dropping those in the chat as well so you can read Brian if you want. All right. So first one is great talk. Uh, you mentioned that the age of the growth layers is still not very well constrained though. The, the layer is consistent, but you think the growth layers are annual or seasonal? What analysis uh, would help you constrain the age of the growth layer? This is, this is the bane of my existence. I don't know a great way of constraining the age. My <laughs> assumption is that these are potentially like daily growth layers, because if you look at them from what I've actually shown to, um, other stuff that I've looked at, you're kind of ranging between somewhere like 20 to uh, 20 to uh, sometimes up to about 200. So if we went and we presumed that they were, say, even weekly, that would imply that some of these guys live for a year and a half. And maybe what I didn't explain properly is these organisms are tiny. They're uh, potentially 10 centimeters, maybe up to about 30 at the largest. So you would imagine if you had an ocean full of these guys, and we believe that it was full of these guys because you can find them everywhere, like hundreds of them in like uh, rocks, then they probably were like a really nice snack for everything else that was living there. So the idea of if we said that this was seasonal or yearly, that would imply that something so small was able to live for years at a time. Um, and I mean, that is also possible, but uh, that would have been my assumption how we would actually do it. I'm not a hundred percent sure how we would actually constrain what these meant. Is that a good answer? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a difficult, difficult question. So <laughs> there's if, anyone, not... if, if anyone has ideas, I'm more than willing to listen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we actually have a, a question from Gills here in the chat. So I think that's, yeah, we can, we can go to this one. So you mentioned that you'd like to have, go at analyzing soft tissues. We are lucky enough to have one of, of the grant specimens at the NHM. What analysis would you suggest for such rare material? So, Oh, that is also a very interesting question. Um, hmm. I know I, I had made it as kind of a joke because um, there has been statements made in the department that we can't leave samples around because Brian is probably going to chop it up. So with such like rare material, I would tend to, um, I, I don't see the benefit in actually chopping it up. It depends on if anything has been done with it before. I mean, you can use stuff like um, X-ray fluorescence or even uh, so, to the best of our knowledge, uh, people try and CT scan these things to try and actually see if you can look at the, you wouldn't very easily be able to see these structures in 3D. But I think what I would suggest is like X-ray fluorescence, if you can get it under an SEM, I would try and get SEM photos of those because they're not that rare, they're not that common. Maybe we're seeing smaller structures than we can with just a light microscope. Um, but it depends on if work has been done on this actual sample before. So I know there was quite a few that were taken from the Granton uh, shrimp beds, but they're not, not a lot of the samples have, um, or it's only really the, the better ones have been published on. And I think to the best of my knowledge that most of that little horizon that they came from is more or less gone now. So it's not like we can go out and try and find better or more of them. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of depends on the sample itself. Okay. Okay. So yeah, uh, we actually have someone that raised their hands to to ask you the question directly. It's Mark for now. I'm gonna allow them to unmute. Yep. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, Brian. Great talk. Um, uh, so my question was about the internal lamination as well and the, and the, and the, the issue of how long did conodonts live? And I think there is there is value to sort of making assumptions around how long it took to deposit each lamella, counting mm -hmm. them and everything. However, I mean, you, your work has um, nicely confirmed uh, the stuff that Phil Donahue and I did uh, a while ago, mm -hmm. should we say, uh, where <laughs> yeah, we have these these internal discontinuities which clearly represent intervals when the element was functioning and mm -hmm. became damaged. And what what we don't know when it comes to working out how long these things lived is, is yeah, you can make assumptions about how long each lamellum took to deposit, but we don't know what those intervals of function represent in terms of time. And mm -hmm. they could have been much, much longer. It's a bit like unconformities in stratigraphic sequences. It's very difficult to work out how much time is represented by what's not recorded. Yeah. So I wonder if you'd got any speculations around that and whether that potentially was uh, something that, again, was periodic. So you've got the the intervals of deposition of the individual lamella and then mm -hmm. the alternations of function and non-functioning deposition of lamellae and whether mm -hmm. that would give us a more nuanced view of conodont uh, life histories. Um, so yeah, actually, Mark brings up a, a really good point, which is an issue with, um, probably one of the biggest issues with conodonts in general is we have a, a really good idea of how they grew. Um, but if you can imagine that you have something, you're trying to grow these layers, you need something on top of that to deposit, um, these individual growth layers. So as you're building up and up and up, as something biomineralizes, it's generally in contact with soft tissue itself. Um, what Merrick brings up, which is something that I kind of neglected to say, is he has a, with what I was showing before, you can see these individual growth layers, and then there's a part in which it's broken. So currently we think that there was periods in which it was covered in soft tissue and then periods where it wasn't. And it's so that would imply that Kamenons went through these cycles of actually let me just move this over here. So I'm looking at the camera. Um Kamenons would have went through these cycles where they were feeding for a little bit and then they would have gone, potentially taken a break. And then this is from the paper I was referring to. Uh, 12 or 16 of these layers would have been um deposited. And it, it's true, I don't know how to address these hiatuses in growth because they are very clearly hiatuses where uh, something was growing for a while, functioned for a while, and then grew for a while. Um, sorry, what, what do you mean in terms of a question? Like, is it more, how can we actually potentially address that? <laughs> you, know, you made it. You made a number of statements around how long conodonts lived based on just counting the lamellae, but that that really doesn't take into account these unknown intervals of time, which which could have been months. I mean, these things were pretty small. How quickly they wore down and damaged those surfaces, we we just don't know. I guess. So I think it may be yeah. counting counting the old counting the individual lamellae, perhaps. Actually, that's that's a a pretty good point too, but. Um, I know I made it sound like in an ideal world, what I would love to do is have tens of sessions from different uh, species, different genus, whatever, and try and see if we can look at, um, uh, do a comparison to see if we can look at um, these cyclicity, this cyclicity of growth because it seems to be a cyclicity where you've got a certain number are deposited on top, then you have a break where it functions. Like we, we'd run into issues also, if you look at different comedants, um, did, did they, um, uh, ba, 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 did they, did some of them like feed for longer than others? You know what I mean? And um, you stumped me a little bit, not going to lie. It's it's a question, but I don't know if we if I have an excellent answer to it. 
Um, I don't know how we would quantify that. Uh, we have an issue where if we had a modern um, extant animal that we could actually analyze similar feeding strategies, that would probably be the best way to do it. But to the best of my knowledge, we don't really have something that we can use for that. Okay. Thanks. I agree. It, it's tricky. It is, it is a very tricky, and it's not like I haven't thought about this, but it's more, uh, yeah, I don't know, if you've got ideas, I'm more than willing to hear them. Uh, so let's proceed. We have another question from Gills. Um, then I'm going to drop the chat as well. So he, asked that, he said that, I noticed that you refer to the conodont elements as teeth. Does that mean you consider them homologous with gnetostomes? In, no, there is a there is a paper from Duncan Murdoch. I can't remember the year, but he kind of shows that they're not homologous. I refer to them as teeth. I think uh, I've had this discussion before for multiple time uh, with with a couple of people. The reason why I call them teeth is not necessarily because they're homologous with. Um, or a lot of people refer to them as dental tools. But a um, uh, fantastic argument that Amelia told me at one point was, you know, you've got a leg on a human and you've got a leg on an insect. You still call them legs um, because they function and they do the same thing. It's the same with if you look at wings, like the difference between flying insects that you see with like um, birds or whatever. It's, it, it is just that these things have evolved multiple times and they're not necessarily related to each other. But I, I call them teeth for simplicity because that is how they function. But um, in the majority of stuff, it would be, you know, people refer to them as dental tools or had a, a tooth-like function. I don't know if I fully agree with that because especially, okay, you've got these ones in the front that were used for grasping, which don't really work as teeth as we would picture them. But these P elements have been shown from multiple authors using multiple techniques that these basically ground the same the way that our molars do. Um, so yeah, this is kind of my justification of why I call them teeth. Um, is it 100% correct? It's difficult to say, but that is that is basically my justification for why I do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, we do have another question. Chat, chat again. So it's, have you looked at other trace elements in addition to strontium to investigate the traffic variability between different growth stage, stages? Um, no, I haven't. And it's, uh, I, I haven't because, uh, you could clearly see this, um, going back and it's something that, you know, potentially should have done was look at actually the ratios between, uh, strontium barium, strontium calcium. And um, this is kind of the process that we take now because they're actually better analogs or, you know, um, these are better ways to actually look at trophic variability is the ratio between these things. In terms of other elements, um, I gathered this data quite a while ago, um, nothing has as clear a trend in conodonts that I have seen as the strontium does. So we use strontium predominantly either be it in ratios or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. that's why we use it. It's also, so most of my studies are based on EDX, but EDX is not the, the, the most accurate. I mean, we can't really look at trace elements. We can't look at elements that are below, ooh, I'm going to say off the top of my head, 0 0.1 weight percent, and maybe it's 0 0.01. I can't fully remember. And I don't have the picture. And if somebody was to do that study, I would recommend they go and use something that has a much a, a one higher spatial resolution and higher accuracy. Um, I use EDX because that is what I have access to. I have, I could have access to these more complex things, but yeah, it, 
you can you can do stuff like uh, microprobe is a much better example, which is very similar technique, just higher resolution. You can use stuff like uh, laser ICPMS, which uh, one of one of our students has done with uh, other fossils to try and look at um, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, uh, migrations of animals. But with with conodonts, it was just strontium is the easiest and the best record we have. Um, that being said, if we shove it in something else, if we have something with a higher resolution, then maybe we're going to see um, other elements that can be used as different proxies for different things uh, or for trophic variability. But uh, yeah, these samples, <laughs> I could probably do it. I still have the samples. Hmm. Um, it, it, it's also a thing that... Uh, when you do these techniques, like what I do is like very destructive and, um, you know, you're chopping stuff in half. But if you want to do EDX and you want to do backscatter and you want to do different analytical techniques, you have to basically work your way because you're doing EDX. It's going to blow holes into conodonts. Um, or if you want to do microprobe, it's actually worse. So we have a system where we can scan multiple things or uh, with doing the least amount of damage. And that's why I use EDX. It's another reason why I use EDX. That help? Yep, yep. Uh, so we do have a last question so far. So um, drop the chat as well. So great talk. Uh, do you have a sense of how long Conodon keeps its teeth? Are they a lifetime investment, or do they think do you think they can be shed or re resorbed uh, and remade like some excellent fish? Um, no, we we kind of are pretty confident. I say uh, we're pretty confident that these were a lifetime investment. That uh, when the Canada was doing it, there has been theories before that. Conodonts um, have shed their teeth, but to the best of my knowledge, these have been debunked. I am drawing a blank of how they did that, which, um, but yeah, ge the general consensus is that these were a lifetime investment. We would run into a lot more issues if they weren't. Um, I think this runs into sort of issues with, if you wanted to do similar studies with, um, uh, like scales, scales for you've got like Devonian fishes and stuff have a similar makeup to uh, teeth. And you can also, um, you could theoretically do something similar with this, but there's also an issue that sometimes they shed or sometimes they fall off before the animal has like reached maturity and things like that. Um, so yeah, the our, our current working is that these were actually a lifetime investment for the animal and didn't um, get reabsorbed or shed or anything like that. Nice. So cool. I think that was the last question. Uh, so I'm going to take the screen share and cool. you should. Just making sure. Yeah. You're seeing this like now, right? It's just making sure I'm sharing the right thing. Uh, so yeah, thank, thank you again, Brian. It was a, a great, great talk and really enjoyed no the problem. answers as well. Thanks. Uh, so um, just wanted, wanted to thank everyone that uh, came to, to watch the talk as well, that people that uh, participated as well, thank you very much. Uh, if you would like to give us feedback again, we're going to drop the, the link for the form on the, in the chat. And I'd like to invite you to come next week to, to hear Jeb Van Dijk from New Trash to talk about quick recover of the biological pump across the KPG mass extinction. Uh, so, yes. No? Two slides. Go back. It's not coming back. Oh, no, yes, it's a. I think there's a little bit of uh, lag here. Yeah, now it's working. So uh, next, we're gonna uh, proceed to tea time. So now it's, it's a good opportunity for everyone to talk to Brian a bit more about the research, ask 
further questions and also talk about uh, his career path and, and other stuff as well. It's also a good um, uh, opportunity to talk to old friends or meet new ones and to talk with people uh, with different backgrounds in paleo. And so we're going to have a short two minutes break before the tea time so people can go to the bathroom, stretch their legs, grab something to drink, and we hope to see uh, everyone in two minutes. See you.